Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ask the Bootmaker. Today we have a bootmaker from Colorado, studied leatherworking and shoe and bootmaking all across the country. Even studied under recent guest Dina McGuffin in New Mexico. Please welcome today Emily Boxerbaum of Underhill Leather. Thank you. Emily, for joining me here on this Ask the Bootmaker episode. How's it going today? Um, it's going great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy we finally got to do this. I'm excited. Me too. Me too. This is going to be awesome. I got some questions for you. I got some, uh, maybe like eight questions that I've already planned. And then, of course, folks are going to be coming in through the live chat as well. And if they have any questions, I'll relay them on to you uh, too. So uh, if you are watching and you are live, uh, please feel free to use the live chat below and uh, ask any questions that you have of Emily from Underhill Leather. Uh, I'm going to get us kicked off here with uh, with with one that I feel is necessary because uh, boot making and leather working, uh, like any art, is not something that's really easy to start, learn, and build a career in. So I want to know how you got started with leather working and boot making. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we got all we got all day. Let's get um, into it. You are not wrong. It's it's hard to get a start in this, and um, I feel like you know my my journey through it has been somewhat unique. Like I didn't grow up out west. I didn't grow up wearing cowboy boots. Um, I did grow up loving decorative art and decorative objects. Um, so to kind of put the journey into a shorter story, um, I went to school for painting, got to school in Chicago, um, didn't do a lot of painting, just sort of geeked out and started taking classes in like every department they offered, which was such a luxury. Um, cause I just got obsessed with like making stuff and tinkering around, so I was taking classes in like holography and neon bending and kinetic sculpture and robotics, like all this random stuff that I knew nothing about. Um, and I just got like a high off of learning a new skill. Um, and so eventually I made my way into the textiles department. And one of my professors hooked me up with this artist in Chicago um, named Casey Gunshell, who is to this day, like a very special friend and mentor to me. Um, and Casey was tooling leather, which I had never seen before. Um, I like kind of knew of like carved other things like stone and wood. Um, and I saw her work and y'all should look it up because it's, it's mind blowing. She does these large scale um, panels. So basically she'll tool a design on an entire hide, like the entire cow hide and make a panel out of it. And then install it into like interior design settings. So like tables, walls. Um, so my first job out of college was her assistant just like tooling away like all day because they're such large scale um, works. And so I put my 10,000 hours in with that. And then that's how I was introduced to leather as a medium. Um, and it was really cool because I started off sort of as her apprentice, able to kind of just fucks with it and learn and practice. Um, and then her work is just this amazing like mix of old tradition with her own unique spin on it. Like she doesn't do the traditional Sheridan floral scroll that you think of when you think of tooled leather. She does these crazy, like um, just her own artistic sense, um, like her own drawings basically. And so, yeah, so she just sort of introduced me to the world. And then, you know, she and I went out to learn saddle making. And I learned a little bit more about construction um, with Lisa and Lauren Skyhorse in Durango, Colorado, who are amazing. And um, then, yeah, I, I think at some point I was like, I need my own path here. And it's got to be leather work. And I wanted to learn shoemaking specifically. And leather works easy enough to kind of go online on Tandy and get your tools and, you know, like learn your first saddle stitch. And there's a lot of books out there and YouTube, and that's a little easier to sort of self-teach. Um, 
but it was that next step of like, I know people make shoes. How cool is that? And like, how can I learn that? Um, so I'd moved to New York and there's a school there called the Brooklyn Shoe Space. Um, they're amazing. And there's this great community there of makers. Um, and I took a class there. That was my first introduction to shoemaking. And so that was like, they had the tools, they had the machinery, they had a bunch of sewing machines that I could like jam up the bombin on and have, you know, body, body, the studio manager, like come over and fix it for me and help me and show me, you know, what I was doing wrong. So that was a blessing to have that. Um, and that was difficult though, because it also costs money to be a member and, you know, to nurture something like leather work. There's so many tools and so many, um, you know, machines and like putting the studio together, I think is like sort of the hardest step because you need your 10,000 hours and you got to have a place to do it. Um, and a lot of people are lucky enough to come across apprenticeships and stuff like that. Um, but for me, the, I ended up, eventually I learned cement construction at the Brooklyn Shoe Space, so just gluing. And I wanted to learn welding. And as I researched more and learned more, I was like, this is the, ult the cowboy boot is the ultimate, you know, leather construction project for me. That's what I'm talking about. Right. And so um, I reached out to Dina and I took a class with her and that was brilliant. I mean, I felt like we just clicked immediately, but I'm sure all of her students say that because she's just divine. She's um, awesome. Yeah. So cool. Um, and yeah, I, I had a background already going in with her. So I was able to breeze through a lot of the steps and then really focus on learning the things I hadn't learned yet. So like the welting and um, crimping and all of that stuff. And then, yeah, just sort of have been making like one pair of boots at a time. And every time I make a pair of boots, I can buy crimping boards or screws or, um, you know, saving the money to go back into the business um, and just inching forward, you know, step by step. And I've had other jobs along the way that sort of, you know, pay for rent, pay for all that. But I just sort of like funnel it all in to nurturing that, the leather work. And I, I do it every day. I think that's sort of the other part of it is, you know, you said like, it's hard to get into leather work for sure. I just like fostering it as it's kind of an obsession for me. So I need to be in the studio every day. Um, but also just making sure that I get to the studio every day is a big part of it. Yeah. It's a very traditional sort of career that you think about it from like, um, a hundred years ago, even before then, like it's been around forever, but yet there isn't really a school or a path that is readily available to folks out there. So it's kind of like, it sounds like you're piecing together your own road towards leatherworking and boot making. Yeah, absolutely. I actually spent some time working in the corporate footwear industry as a, a prototyper and designer, which is kind of crazy. I was I had just learned how to make cowboy boots and I was living in New York and the brand Cole Haan um, reached out to me because they were developing an innovation lab, which was so cool. And I learned a lot while I was there. I found out that the corporate setting is not for me um, because I am such a, you know, tangible maker type person. And um, I learned a lot that I use today with my clients in terms of like using Illustrator to make a, you know, a a really detailed sketch beforehand because so much of my work is about the design work. Um, so really showing a client like what the boot is going to look like, you know, I picked up a lot um, at this job, but when I was there, it just was so surprising to me that there are not schools. You know, if you go through design school, you want to be, you know, a sneaker designer or just a shoe designer in general you learn how to make these gorgeous illustrations that are textured and rendered perfectly, like, you know, in the graphic design sense, but you've like never, you know, picked up a sky knife, you know, you don't know how to make the thing. And then, you know, there's a material knowledge there, um, but it's just like, we don't teach because, um, you know, though there is this like made in America thing that's coming back. And I think like, 
globalization's brought us to a weird place where everything was made in China, and now China has the upper hand in terms of um, these well-oiled factories that, you know, they know how to do the thing that the brands in other countries want done. So the prices are going up. It's not like the cheap labor it's been. Um, and uh, I think the tide is turning, but still in America, at least you're not going to school to learn how to make something. We don't value trade schools the way we used to, vocational schools, which I think is a big mistake. Um, I think it's, there are a lot of people with that sensibility that could be so successful um, in, you know, trade schools, and, but yeah, but we'll yeah. see. I think things are changing, sort of going back a little bit out of necessity. I think so too. That's a good point that you, that you brought up because we never really think about it like that, where we're going to school to design these things, but then it's just like, it's common sense almost where it's just going to be designed to send to a factory overseas yeah. and then they'll make it right. Yeah. But like you're saying, you have value in actually working with these materials to know what is possible so that maybe you won't run into issues down the line and have to you know, face enormous recalls or something. Totally. It was really cool working with designers um, who were really thinking about the aesthetic. And then I was sort of thinking about the construction because I'd get like a beautiful drawing and there'd be like, I don't know, like a, a glare from the boot because you can tell they've rendered this one specific place to be shiny. And so there's like a little glimmer in the illustration but maybe there's like a line somewhere else. And I'm like, what is this here? Is this a stitch line? Is this like, you know, it's really easy to like draw something to make it look really cool, but to actually think about what the pattern's gonna look like, how it all goes together, it's like a completely different thing. And that's the thing that I'm just obsessed with is like figuring it out, like figuring out how the pattern's gonna fit together, but also look, you know, the way you want it, look proportional, look the way you want it to look. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, to kind of go off of what you were saying here, we did get a uh, comment in the live chat with a question. And I want to remind everybody who is watching or listening while you work that you can put a question for Emily of Underhill Leather in the live chat. If you have any questions as our conversation continues here, uh, the first question here uh, that kind of works off of what we were just talking about and you learning leather work and cowboy boots, uh, Smack Daddyus wants to know what is the most challenging part of learning how to make cowboy boots. That's interesting. You know, for me that changes every day because I've learned so much and I'm learning so much right now. Um, I think like just recently I've gotten a lot of momentum. So having the orders coming in and like having all of the making time sort of compounded, um, I'll have a new sort of aha moment with every boot that I make. Um, so I think the first part of that, the most challenging thing was learning fit for me. Um, like I, you know, you can, boot making is one of those things where, because it's a physical process, you know, Dina sh showed me how to make a boot um, from start to finish. I took tons of notes. I have videos of her that I still go back and watch like five years later. Um, and she showed me the steps and then like they register more clearly after I've done them on different pairs of boots over and over and over again for years. So I'll just have these moments of like, oh my God, that's what she meant. Or, oh, this thing that I've been doing for the past seven, you know, whatever years is for this purpose. And I didn't realize it, but the thing that I initially struggled with most was um, putting the pattern pieces together to fit the client specifically. Um, but now I think uh, that kind of just got easier. So that's not my answer now, I guess, because I've learned. Um, right now, my hump is finishing the heel, which I also, um, I just spend so, I was just saying, I just sent out a pair of boots and I could just spend like nine days, you know, sanding and finishing a heel. But at some point you have to be like, this is the product it's done. I have to put the final 
coats on and send it out. Um, and so right now, that's my hardest part. The sort of like initial hardest was like wilting and stuff that I just like didn't know how to do. But once you do it a bunch, it's not the hardest part anymore. Right now, though, my answer is, yeah, just like I feel like I'm getting better at finishing the heel. So I want to spend a ton of time on it. So I'm also more critical about it because now I have these new goals when it comes to that. I hear you. And that's how that's how you grow and get better. Uh, but just so you know, I've talked to boot makers who have done it for 40, 50 years, and they're still trying to figure out the best way to finish a pair of cowboy boots. Like yeah. finishing seems to be like the thing that you could from what I've talked to. I've never made a pair of boots myself, but talked to a lot of boot makers and they're all like finishing is always the most difficult part where they could just right. keep like buffing or keep doing this or that. Yeah. You gotta cut yourself off though. Just say <laughs> what's done is done. No doubt. I think that goes uh for a lot of different industries and just art in general, too. Yeah. Uh, now you've been traveling all over the country to uh learn these different things, like you said, Chicago, New York, New Mexico, Colorado. And I'm wondering if traveling and learning in those different areas has you know shaped uh a, a a certain perspective of your craft has given you a little bit different view from maybe just learning in one region. Oh, hundred um, percent. I'll say, like I said, I'm from Rhode Island and the West to me is sort of this magical place. And I, um, I moved to Colorado last year. So I'm a transplant. I'm new to Colorado. Um, but when I was 23, I took a road trip um, from Rhode Island to Seattle. And when I was driving through Wyoming, it was the first time I'd ever seen Western mountains. Um, Cause I grew up, I had been to the Appalachians. I, you know, grew up with a lot of nature in my life, but I had never seen, I just remember driving as with two girlfriends. It was the first time I'd like, you know, been further West than Chicago. And um, just seeing those mountains on the horizon, like changed my perspective of space and time. Like I just was like, I had like a crazy moment, like crazy, crazy. Um, and for like a decade after it was like, I have to get back to the mountains. And I always traveled out West. I lived in Chicago and then I lived in Brooklyn for about six years um, and just felt this calling out here um, and learned all my learning was out West. So like, like you said, Chicago, and then I was in Durango um, and then in Albuquerque. And so like doing leather work out West is like this happy spot for me where it's been this like seeking further education and um, there's just more space out here and the mountains make me feel like embraced and hugged in this like, you know, just human nature connection kind of way. So yes, definitely the travel has like inspired me as an artist. Um, and then also just practically uh, coming out to Colorado, I was able to get a proper studio space. Um, I'd been in Brooklyn in a two room apartment, like sanding in my bathroom, gluing in my bathroom with the window open in the dead of winter, just like, <laughs> I still, you know, I still don't have a full studio. Um, like I was saying before, it's like the hardest part. It's like I grow it a little bit every order I get. Um, one day I'm going to have, you know, the best, the most ideal studio. Um, but part of like moving out here and having a little more space has really been this, like, you know, I, I walk outside and the mountains are out there um, and it's just, it's a better, there's more room to breathe. Um, and boot making is a different, it's a different pace. It's, you know, um, there are, I know a lot of artists who live and work in, in big cities and that's a different kind of hustle, I think. Whereas boot making is certainly a hustle. I'd say it is not easy to, it's a, it's like a niche thing right now because it's a, a dying art in a way. And it, we're keeping alive this like hand building tradition but you have to find the right clients. Um, you have to find the people to buy your work. Um, 
And that's a hustle, but I do think that like, I can breathe a little more out here in a way that, you know, New York moves a little faster um, and also just is insanely expensive. So that's another, yeah. another added thing, but yeah. yeah, I know exactly what you mean about seeing those Western mountains for the first time. I remember moving from uh, uh, upstate Western New York here um, out to Phoenix um, back in 2012 oh, yeah. with my wife. And when we hit New Mexico, I'd never been out West before, but when we hit New Mexico and I saw those like desert mountains and hills yeah. and stuff, like I just literally cried and I had the same experience that you had. It's like, it just changed my life um, completely. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's You're so like, powerful. It's, so wow. moving. it's a different planet. Mm -hmm. It's a different, it feels different. Like the time here feels different. And it's funny, I moved out here. Um, my husband works in music, so pandemic, nothing. We kind of both were like, okay, like we're remote. We know how to do remote now. And, you know, we're both itching to be in a more outdoorsy setting. Um, we both love love it out here. So um, yeah, we were like, we need, we need to get to the mountains. Um, and so we ended up just staying out here for a month to see what it would be like. And it's so, it feels so cheesy, but we were like turning to everyone that we met, just being like, wow, do you like, you've lived here for 20 years. Do you still just like look at the mountains and think, who am I? I like, I'm small, the mountains are big. Like, <laughs> and everyone was like, yes, that's why we live here, which I think <laughs> was really cool. Um, that's awesome. They weren't like, oh, go back east. I know, right? <laughs> I mean, they probably were for other reasons, but <laughs> they do share that, like, yes, we're humans within this bigger structure sort of mentality, which is nice. That, that's awesome. Yes, it is so inspiring out west, and I'm glad that you're taking advantage of it. Um, to get back to Dina, uh, Dina McGuffin, uh, yeah. I texted her to get some details for this uh, interview. So. Really? Yeah. So she says that here's what she said when I texted her. She yeah. says that she's proud of the work that you're doing and says that oh. your designs are different and interesting and that it's a good feeling to see students take what they learn and make it their own. Um, and I'm sort of curious if you've always done that to some extent, learn something and then integrate it to, into your own style. You talked about like your, your tooling friend who sort of does that too, like does her own work on the leather. Yeah. Have you always done that too? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm honored and flattered that she said that because um, that's exactly what I want to be doing. Um, I, yeah, I think I've always done that. I think part of it is a little bit like of a, an attention span thing. Like, <laughs> like I, I don't replicate. I never have. Um, Cause I maybe don't, I'm, I don't get in, like into the details of the, of tradition. Um, what I've learned about boot making is everyone has their own tradition, which is interesting. Learning from Dina, the best thing would be like, she, she has like a, you know, a special lip knife or something. And I'm like, cool, where can I buy it? She's like, well, daddy made this. Uh, you can't like, this is something, you know, this is, this is how I do it. And it was like passed down to me, but like, it doesn't exist outside of this shop, you know? Um, so I think sort of knowing that I, yeah, I take my, I take what I learn and I make it into my own. And I do that with the boot making too. I like to stick, you know, I, I do, it is a traditional process. I pretty much do exactly what Dina taught me, um, from start to finish on a cowboy boot. Um, but there are a few things that I'll alter the process a little bit um, just to make it either easier or to like accommodate like a, a weird design, that idea that I wanna do. Um, I don't think I'm afraid to stray from, you know, how the pattern goes together in a traditional sense. But I do think having those methods, it, I think it was really important for me to train with her. I actually always wish that I could have trained longer with someone um, in a, you know, professional sense, I have some friends who are just like purely apprenticing a cowboy boot maker. Um, and 
I think on the one hand, not doing that has allowed me to create my own processes and do something cool and different and special. And a lot of my clients are not like cowboy boot wearers. Um, and so then I can appeal to a wider audience too, just people who want crazy decked out boots. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, you know, that I want to just like go to school for cowboy boot making all the, like, I just want to like watch all the greats all the time. Like if I didn't have to like make bread and butter, I would just like go visit all of the, you know, amazing cowboy boot makers out there and try to train with them if I could. So, yeah. That sounds epic. A, a nice little tour, maybe two or three Wouldn't weeks with each boot maker. Yeah. That'd be amazing. So is that what you feel uh, makes your boots different from other boot makers is that you kind of take a little bit of tradition, a little bit of your own art and experience and sort of mix it together? Or is there something else that you feel makes your boots different from other custom boot makers in the industry? Well, I'd say one thing that I do that I don't see anyone else doing is, I'm not, my dog's going out. Okay, come here. Mm -hmm. Is um, I paint my boots. Um, but I still do inlay, so I'll I'll paint. So I get this crazy palette, um, like variety of colors, um, and then I can, you know, I could just do more with that um, rather than sticking to really just getting specific leathers and doing inlay with the colors that are available. Um, and I really have no. I, I like to do, um, my favorite projects are like sentimental based illustrations, if that makes sense, um, which I, a lot of cowboy boot makers do. Um, but a lot of cowboy boot makers also use, you know, pre-made patterns and stuff, um, which I've never really gotten into that much. Um, I like to do, I like to think of the process as like, I'm expressing the client's life through my artwork on a pair of boots, which is like kind of a crazy specific thing. Um, but you know, the best experiences I've had is like, I made a pair of um, Badland boots. They're the a mountain range, which I've done a couple of times since. Um, and the inspiration behind that was the client uh, had, had this really specific connection with his wife um, and it was their one year anniversary and they had their proposal happen for their marriage in the Badlands. They had also scattered her father's ashes there. They had this really specific connection to it. And then we represented that on the boot and she wears boots a lot. And so it just became this really special thing. Um, another client I did, these swift birds flying about. And she had told me, you know, every night I watch the, the sunset and I watch all these swift birds flying around in these patterns as the sunset. And that's just a really special part of my day. And so then we represented that on the boots. And so it just becomes this really neat, you know, it's such a long process to make the boots. It becomes as much about like my connection with the client. Um, at the end of the thing. I'm gonna let this dog out. Hold on one second. All right, yeah, sounds good. If you guys wanna learn more about Emily and Underhill Leather, uh, she does have a website. I think it's just underhillleather.com. Is that what yes. it is? Underhillleather.com, three L's. I have a website. Um, I've gotten some crazy momentum on Instagram. I never thought that that would be a thing, but I get a lot of orders from Instagram which has been nuts. Yeah, your Instagram is awesome. I love yeah. the boots that you post. Yeah, so that's where I am. Online. To get back to uh, the, the process and um, painting boots, the inlay, the artistry that you do on your boots, we got a question here from Neil um, in Scotland. Uh, he asks, what is the longest and shortest time you've spent making a pair of boots? I'm sure art, painting, it can go on for quite a long time, I bet. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a good question. 
I usually, I mean, in a sense, I'll say like 60 to 200 hours, which I think I kind of made up. I've like kept track before of how long it takes to make a pair of boots. Um, but I can, I can make a pair in a week if there's nothing on them. You know what I mean? Um, like the pair I just sent out or it's just a plain green pair of boots um, can go pretty fast. But then, yeah, I've spent two months on a pair of boots before um, just getting, I mean, the, for me, the design work can take forever. And the way that I do my processes, I have the client get in touch and sometimes they have an idea of what they want or sometimes I'm kind of coming up with like three designs and they pick one and then we go in a direction. And um, I think maybe more than the next boot maker, I spend a lot of time getting that, that, that drawing right. So I'll, you know, you come to me, you say, I want, you know, I like the mountain ranges that I've seen on your other boots. I want it to be this specific mountain range. And I want, you know, yellow daisies because it's my daughter's favorite flower, whatever. And then I'll, I'll draw that for you. But then we go through like probably like four or five iterations of the drawing because I just want to get it right. You know, like I want you to feel like we've both designed it in a way because um, that's when it just feels like you've got this custom thing that was like perfectly designed for you. Not only does it fit you perfectly, but like it, it represents everything that you wanted. So um the design work can take a really long time and also it depends on the client on like how decisive or whether the client actually knows what they want on the boot or not so um i've had i've had design work take about a month before um before i even go into the actual construction so that'll delay it too wow yeah i bet thank you for the question neil uh if anybody else has questions for emily Please feel free to put them in the live chat as we continue our discussion here. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you guys have the chance to ask any questions that come to mind. Now, you're talking about uh, boots that you just shipped out. And I saw on Instagram that you're shipping them out to New Zealand. And I got I to gotta hear this story because, one, I'm like really curious about how you came into contact with that customer. And yeah. also, what it feels like to have a pair of boots that you made on the other side of the planet. So cool. It's a funny story. Um, I met this woman in New Zealand. My, my husband and I just went on a delayed, our, we'd been married for two years, but we just went on our honeymoon. Um, and we went to New Zealand and it was epic and amazing. And just like very much what I said about like coming out West for the first time, seeing that country is just, has, was mind blowing. It's just like, there's so many, different climates and terrains on, you know, just one island, essentially, or two islands, there's a North and South Island. Um, and it was awesome. But we were at this hotel. And I was ordering coffee for us, I guess. And there was this woman sitting right at the bar um, with a giant thing of crispy potatoes. And I'm just like a talkative, you know, kind of annoying person and I, I was like wow those look good just like I don't know to her to myself whatever and she was like oh my gosh you have to have one I have a girlfriend coming I can't I'm on a diet I don't want to eat all these by myself like please take them I was like no 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 I can't it's like nine in the morning it's like uh, no nah. she was like I see your husband over there like take them to him so I like walk over to Ethan with like a handful of potatoes <laughs> um and then we're just sort of like saw this woman a couple times that day and later on I was in the parking lot probably like five hours later and I was we were like unpacking our stuff into the hotel and I just had a pair of boots um and she saw me from across the parking lot and she was like are those cowboy boots like from like all the way like nine cars away and I was like yeah she was like can I look at them she comes over I was like, I actually made them. She's like, what? And you know, people are always really excited to meet a maker, I think, just in general, when you're like, wow, a human makes that thing. How cool is that? She was really excited. She asked me a bunch of questions. She's like, I have to buy them from you right now. Can I buy these? And then she like put them on. 
and they fit her perfectly. Actually, we have like the same shoe size. Like I'm a um, 7D, which is a little wide for women's feet. She's like same exact size. So um, yeah, she she was just like really excited. I was like, well, I can't sell these to you, you know they're mine <laughs> and I make them and I, but I, you know, I make cowboy boots. Um, and she was like, oh my gosh. Okay. Like, how can I buy them from you? And she just went on my website, put the deposit down and then yeah, we measured her feet and, uh, I, I went home. I was still on the trip for about two weeks after that. Um, and I was like, okay, if you, you know, what a, cool like it feels like kismet what a great meeting but like if you decide you change your mind she was like you can't get cowboy boots here if you get them they're like plasticky and fake and kind of hokey because it's like american style something so like she's like you can't get quality cowboy boots here um it's not a tradition that's around and it's so expensive to ship things there um i think her sh our shipping costs there alone was like 200 bucks so um, she she was just really excited. So it was, it was kind of just this amazing thing where like, I feel like just we were meant to meet in that parking lot in New Zealand. And it was very like time and place, like what, who would have thought I'd be in New Zealand at all. But yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I love that, stories like that. That's so yeah. cool. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. My yeah. question is though, um, I mean, I hear about the boot maker's prayer all the time about when customers come in and they try on the boots for the first time and the boot maker is like, please fit, please fit, please fit. <laughs> are you like suffering from that right now on weeks on end while these are in the mail to New Zealand? Horrible. Thank you for acknowledging. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. It, and I, a lot of my clients are not in Colorado where I am. Um, it's, you know, a luxury to have them come back and do you know a fit and then alter a fit alter um or even just to be able to be like oh it's a little tight around your calf like bring them back and I'll stretch them out like no problem rather than like pay shipping to ship them back to me and we can stretch them or you know whatever we need to do I've been pretty lucky with fit so far um I've had like maybe two instances where something needed to be fixed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even just fit. It's anything. I'm like, in my mind, I can get so irrational. I'm like, they're just sitting in the box in the mail falling apart as we speak for no reason. Like, I don't know. I like make up the worst case scenario and certainly it's going to take two weeks to get to her. So I'm like, that. But actually the lucky thing with that is we measured her feet and she, she fit perfectly in those boots that I was wearing and was like, I just want them to be exactly like these. And so that was kind of a lucky thing in this specific instance, because I, I, they fit me perfectly. So I'm figuring they're going to fit her, but still it's like, oh. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. Cause you got to try on yours and luckily right. enough, you're the same size. But how broken in were your boots? Like, did you take that into account? They are very broken in. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and and I actually sent her a note to kind of being like, you know, the leather's going to break in. Leather's a really specific, you know, it's porous, but it's structural. And it's going to take a little bit of time to get them into this sort of supple place that mine were something she really wanted is was the um distressed look on the leather so i chose this like huntery green um like a lot of pull up which just oh, means cool. it has a lot of oil content on it in the yeah. tanning process so it's like going to scratch up and burnish really nicely so that will break in a little faster than another type of leather yeah awesome i bet you she loves them that sounds awesome i hope she does what a great story <laughs> <laughs> I want to remind everybody that if you have any questions uh, for Emily, please put them in the live chat as we continue our conversation. I want to go back to the beginning of our conversation. I had a note here and mm -hmm. you said that you learned robotics uh, yeah. when you were in school and stuff. I'm wondering if anything in your robotics classes you've brought to cowboy boots in some way or, or fashion. That's interesting. Um, 
I, off the bat, I would say no. Um, I was in the, the program was called art and technology, like the department at the school. I made this like crazy box. This was like one of my final projects where it was actually pretty cool. And it was, but it was a little silly is uh, this box where it had these eyes on it. So I had cut into some masonite board um, and then created these sort of fake eyelashes and they were hooked up to tiny little motor and so they were blinking on um i had taken a video of a friend of mine looking at a camera and blinking and i had carved out a little cog so that every time she blinked the little machine would blink and so i had the video of her looking at it and everyone was blinking at the same time both the machine and her so it's kind of like you were never getting all of reality at once. It was like everyone's missing the same thing. That was like the sort of concept behind the piece. Um, but uh, I don't, I've never really mixed the two, the kinetic sculpture kind of thing with boots, no. Um, yeah. What about process or perspective or the way that you think about creating? Yeah, well, definitely, definitely that time in school at the time I was a little hard on myself. I was like, you're, you know, it's a privilege to be in school and I'm having fun learning all these things, but I never specialized in one thing. And so when I got out of school, I was like doing a lot of what I call like art handyman work. Um, I worked in a lot of project production stuff, doing prop styling and building and scenic painting. And I was like good at a lot of different things, but not specialized in any one thing. But that's really helpful like on a set or something when someone's like we need a painting for the living room wall and we need it in five minutes and it's got to be in this color palette and I whip it up and then just bring it set and that kind of thing that like learning all those different processes and having them under my belt definitely prepared me for a process like boot making that has so many little steps to it um and I've taught shoemaking a lot too through Brooklyn Shoe Space. I was teaching classes there for a, but a while and um, teaching it kind of makes you realize like you can guide someone through it for the first time and show them how to do it. But for it to sort of conceptualize and stick in the brain, you have to do it yourself and figure it out and do it like a million more times. Um, and I think that for the, all of that experience exploration of different like how things works how does this material react with this material that all that ex exploring I was doing that really helped me sort of keep track of the different processes and be able to connect things like through a long process like boot making so it definitely helped awesome got another question here from Neil and uh, he asks have you ever made any boots that you didn't want to sell or give away maybe a client uh had asked for a certain design and they came out way better than you thought they did and you're like man i wish these were for me yeah like every pair i make <laughs> that's I, nice that's awesome it's funny um i so i've made um mostly women's boots so far and then out there if you want a crazy decked out pair of you know my style boots hit me up because i want to make more men's boots um and when it's a men's, I just made a pair um, for an awesome client out in Texas um, from Anaconda. And it was my first, I'd used Python once before. I've used a couple of different um, leathers, but it was really kind of my first experience with exotics um, for a client. And it was so fun and they came out really cool. And uh, they were definitely not my size. So it was easier to get, you know what I mean? They're 11D, right? So like, I wasn't even, I was purely going off measurement. I wasn't putting my foot in it at all. And that was super fun. And I could just, I loved them and they came out so cool. And then they were for him. I had made them for him. But like, <laughs> if the client is like close to my size and I put them on, I'm like, 
I love these and I want to, <laughs> and I spent so much time with them, you know, they're like babies and then you send them out into the world and you have to just let it be, but <laughs> let them have their own lives in the end. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so being a young boot maker and leather worker, uh, what do you think is the current state of the industry? You know, is it growing? Uh, and do you think that customer work like yours is, uh, is has a good future or is it in danger of going extinct? I have a couple of things to say about that. I think there are a lot of young people interested in it, which is cool. Um, but like we were talking about before, it's just kind of impossible to do it unless you find that magical apprenticeship. And then even that's a struggle, you know, it is not cheap to live in the world today and it's not a sure bet to train in, in a craft like this. Um, and even I think success in this craft isn't super stable. So I think that's kind of, an, that's gonna not be great and it's gonna make people not pursue it. Um, I think there are people out there like me who just fell in love with it and just want to figure it out at, you know, we'll do anything to figure out how to do this thing. Um, but I also think that there is interest in keeping it alive and, um, and young people want to preserve objects because we're headed towards such a digital world and there is an appreciation for this thing because it's kind of going away that I think will keep it alive. Um, I also think that like the way that fast fashion works, um, it just has to break down at some point. I mean, it's not sustainable, certainly not like in an environmental sense, but also just it, you know, even the, the short time I spent in the footwear industry, I saw uh, big companies just like jumping from country to country, trying to find the cheapest labor. And um, that does it, it's, it's gonna collapse at some point, something's gonna give. And I think that like, at least cement construction will stick around. I don't know about making the full cowboy boot. Um, there are faster ways to make shoes than cowboy boot making. Um, that does not include, you know, pegging with wooden pegs. And, you know, it's more of a quick, like glue it together and put it in like a hydraulic like shoe press and then maybe stick a nail in here and there and then send it on its way that's how you know a factory will do it um but i think i think shoe making will stick around i don't know if full out cowboy boot making will stick around i also think the cost of making a cowboy boot is so insane right now that it's prohibitively expensive for clients um and there are a couple different types of clients and the, the like person who is going to wear their cowboy boot into the ground, which I think is the best kind of client, um, can't always afford to buy a pair of cowboy boots at like $2,500. So it's just, I don't know. I don't know what will happen to the, in that sense um, because then it becomes sort of more of a precious art piece, right? Rather than like a utilitarian um, thing that is made to be worn and worn in. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what will happen. Yeah. Um, and plus cowboy boots and your line of work, especially doesn't react to trends as quickly as fast fashion does. I mean, you yeah. have, you know, last year or two years ago, it was the eighties and now all of a sudden we get the nineties again. And like, how many times does this wheel have to go around? Like in the two, what was there in the early two thousands that we can actually go back to? Like, I don't, I don't even remember. So yeah. how, how often can we kind of come back to these trends that we see so frequently when cowboy boots has just been there the whole time and it's just yeah. been the same, you know, maybe there's been a different kind of color or maybe they had um, the wingtips uh, in the 80s because of uh, the urban cowboy and stuff like yeah. that. So it's just been little changes here and there, but most of it has ultimately been the same. And if it stood that test of time, 
maybe it will stand the test of, you know, 100, 200 more years? Yeah, I think I think to what you're saying, cowboy boots are totally timeless. Um, I, I think fast fashion will continue to make cowboy boots. I think we'll continue to make them um, with cheap labor. But I think the handmade cowboy boot is is going to be harder to like maintain in the future. I think the silhouette of the cowboy boot will be around forever. It has a rich history, um, and it's you know I think it, I think it comes back into style every couple of years. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, the trends change fast these days. It's nuts. Um, there's a forecaster called WGSN that like. Um, if you work in the fashion industry, you kind of look at it as like it's going to predict what's going to be in trending next year or whatever. And right now it's saying like DIY sort of handmade stuff is coming back in. Um, but and it, it doesn't usually it doesn't usually refer to construction. It's usually like just aesthetic or just like style. So I thought that was really interesting that like handmade stuff is going to come back into style. Or at um, least look like it's handmade. Right. Yes. It's always, <laughs> always got to check that, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I, I do think that like um, cowboy boots go with anything, but that's my own, that's my own um, opinion. Well, you know, I agree. And everybody watching does too. I got two <laughs> more questions for you. Um, one from the live chat and one of my own. Uh, Brand's Eye here wants to know what the craziest design request you've had for a pair of boots has been. Hmm. Craziest is in quotes. So that's up to you to, uh, <laughs> to interpret. Let's see. There, I did have a design request that I didn't end up doing because it just wasn't the, the construction that I do. Um, and, and it was crazy. And the woman had designed it herself. And I, I sent her to some other shoemakers that I thought would benefit her better. Um, and it wasn't crazy. It was just like very colorful and actually totally up my alley. It would have been fun to make. Um, but they were like these zip up boots that went all the way up to like her, um, thighs and that would have been cool but like with a lot of hanging parts and stuff um and I was like I feel like I'm just gonna charge you too much to make this and I don't know if it would like really make sense for both of us um but in terms of cowboy boots I don't know what my craziest cowboy boots have made I think all of mine are kind of crazy <laughs> um I had this one uh, woman who's like a vintage circus collector, like Victorian era um, aesthetic. She just loves it. And they turned out pretty crazy. And uh, we did all these sort of vignettes of like different circus themed things. And so they're pretty crazy for sure. Um, but I but I love them. So like, I, I don't know, maybe just everything I make turns out a little crazy. Yeah, I just no love doubt. The loud aesthetic, and I love this sort of. It's funny because there, I think there's like this line between sort of Western tacky and like my kind of crazy. I mean, maybe it's a my own perceived line, and I think that like the work is different. But um, I just love something that's totally decked out. Um, so those circus boots were probably uh, maybe the craziest. But I'm all for crazy, like whatever, let's top that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like it. I like it. Thank you for the question, Branzai. And if anybody uh, wants to see the crazy designs, head on over to Underhill Leather Instagram. There's lots of cool boots, lots of cool pictures there. I like the one with the tigers on them, to be honest. Tigers are great. Those were for um, the head coach of the Bengals, his wife actually ordered those for me which was a very cool uh client to work with wow yeah that's big time yeah and uh she had seen another pair that I made that had tigers on them and she was like I have to have these I you know <laughs> her whole life her whole wardrobe is Bengal tiger related so 
that was great. And she wears them so well. So awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> I want to finish off with a question here um, because you are a young boot maker and we've been talking about young boot makers, young leather workers in the space. Do you have any uh, words of maybe inspiration or uh, words of wisdom for young leather workers, young boot makers wanting to get in the space and trying to figure out how to navigate it for themselves? I do. Um, and it's kind of an annoying one because I heard this advice when I was a little younger and I didn't really know what to do with it or it seemed kind of obvious and I was like, eh. but then I think I did it and I think that that really helped me. And it's just, it's, it's set yourself up. So like, it's, it's really hard to keep an art practice, whatever it is, painting, sculpture, it's hard to find the space. It's hard to find the time, the resources. Um, but if you set up a studio space, that is the first step. If you know that you want to make boots, every penny you save should go in. I bought this baby, you know, nine years ago now. I was like, I need a post bed machine. I want to make shoes. It was a huge investment for me. And I saved up, bought it, and then moved on to the next thing. And everything is like, I save up, I get it. And then it's there for me. Um, and I'm not, you know, at the whim of not having the proper machinery or whatever. I, I'm just constantly trying to curate this space so that it feeds exactly what I want to do. And then because you invest in it, you have to use it. So just do it. If you don't have a client, make it for yourself. Make it for a brother, a sister, a friend. If you want to learn how to use exotics, just buy the exotics and stick to it and don't quit in the middle of it. Just carry it out to the end. So set yourself up and then use everything that you've set up um, and make it your world. And then you can't get away from it. <laughs> I can agree to that. You know, having to, uh, you know, record music, doing all the stuff, learning how to do it. If I know how to do it and I got the, I got the equipment, then there's no excuses. You got to keep going, keep going. Totally. Keep going. <laughs> You already invested your time and money into it and you wouldn't have done that if you weren't good at it or, you know, had some sort of passion that was pushing you. So it's great advice. Passion. Great advice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for spending your time with us here today during this Ask the Bootmaker. I want to thank everybody watching. Um, can you give us a little bit of a closing here about where people can find you? Uh, and also where your shop is located. We just had a question from Nathan Tuck and uh, maybe the ordering process as well. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for reaching out. I really appreciate this interview. Um, so I'm in Boulder, Colorado right now. Um, my shop is open by appointment only. Um, feel free to DM me. I'm at Underhill Leather, um, three L's in the middle of that. And my website's also underhillleather.com. And my ordering process, um, I'm open to self-measurement. So I do, I prefer in-person measurement, but it's hard, especially during the pandemic, people weren't traveling. So I set up, I have a couple of videos and PDFs that I send to a client to help them measure themselves. And then I hop on FaceTime and um, guide them through it. So I've done that and had success with that. So I'm open to um, not having you come here in person and get measured. I'm also open to, um, you know, traditional um, measuring process in the studio. Um, and so my email is underhillleather at gmail.com. You can email me there and just tell me what you're looking for um, and I can give you a quote and we can hop on a design call and talk about you know what makes you tick and what you want to see on a pair of boots and then um, we start the process from there. Perfect thank you so much uh, definitely follow Emily on Instagram as well guys I'll have links in the description thank you for watching today Emily stick around and everybody else I hope you have a spectacular rest of your day. Peace, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. All right. We.